got no money to fix my car. When I buy gas, don't get me very far. My baby needs some milk to drink, and mama wants her wine. I get a check each week, but I don't know what's mine. I'm losing track. I don't know what to do. I got the budgeting blue. Welcome back to Sensible Chat, the podcast committed to helping you learn positive money mindsets, destroy debt, reduce financial stress, and break the paycheck to paycheck cycle. Today, we're excited to be chatting once again with Michelle Kagan, CPA and author of over a dozen books, including her latest, Debt 101, which she'll talk about today. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get right to the deer of dough, the master of money, the darling of dollars. It is Sensible Bobby. Thanks, Scott. Before we get to Michelle, I want to address a question from our Facebook group. By the way, if you haven't joined our Sensible Chat Facebook group yet, do it now. I'd love to chat with you between episodes and find out what's on your mind. The question was, have I looked into car repair insurance as an alternative to having a savings fund for car repairs? So I poked around a bit to find info on this kind of insurance, and it does exist. Geico and Mercury Insurance are among the companies offering it. But is it a good idea? In my view, no. Here's why. First, I don't want to jump through a bunch of hoops to get my car repaired. Nothing is ever quick and easy through insurance companies, and I need to get to work. So if there's a repair that needs to be done to my car, I don't want to wait to file a claim, have the insurance company approve it, and then approve where I'm going to go to get my car fixed. No, I just want to be able to go and take care of it myself. Second, from what I've read, you have to sign up for this insurance when your car is less than 15 months old and has less than 15,000 miles on it. Personally, I'll never buy a car that new anyway, and they usually don't need repairs that fast. If they do, it's going to be very minor. And these insurance policies come with a deductible between $100 and $250. So for the minor things, I'm just going to pay out of pocket anyway. And a car that's that new probably isn't going to need anything major during that time. So I can't see paying a monthly premium for that coverage. And by the way, if I have a car that new, it's probably still going to be under warranty. So a lot of those things are already going to be covered. The other thing I read is that in general, the coverage for these insurance policies will end when your car is seven years old or has 100,000 miles on it. Well, this is when the significant stuff starts happening anyway, right? I mean, you may need a new transmission, major things like that start happening when the car gets older, i.e. after 100,000 miles. So if my insurance will lapse at that point, what's the point in me paying for coverage that I may not need until that time? In my view, it just seems easier and more cost effective to save for these repairs myself so I can control when and where I get my car fixed. Plus, if I get through an entire year without needing to use that money, I still have the money because I didn't spend it on the premium just in case. Now, I don't even know how much the premiums on this insurance would cost. And I don't care because it's not worth it in my view. But Wallet Hub has a great article on this, and I'll put a link in the show notes so you can go and check it out for yourself and see if it's worth it for you. Let's get to our topic for the day, which is debt. Debt is literally a four letter word and one that I often wish we could just remove from our language entirely. But it's ingrained into our everyday lives, and so many people are suffering because of it then there are a few who've actually gotten benefits from it. Either way, you need to understand how debt works and what your choices are in order to make your best financial decisions. What makes debt devastating is that many of us don't understand it before we become mired in it. A lot of times, if we had understood what we were actually signing up for, we never would have done it in the first place. That's why I'm so glad Michelle Kagan wrote her latest book, Debt 101. Welcome back, budget students. Sensible University is now in session. Today's guest professor is Michelle Kagan, CPA, financial mentor, and author of more than a dozen books and countless articles on accounting and finance. With more than 20 years of experience, Michelle focuses on helping people navigate their personal and business finances to solidify their financial futures. She has dedicated her career to helping people gain financial independence. 
Michelle, welcome back and thanks for being our guest professor again today. Thanks so much for having me, Bobby. It's such an important topic. You know, debt is something that most of us have or will deal with at some point in our lives, but it's become so normal in our society and it really can wreak havoc on our lives if we let it get out of control. We all hear that there's good debt versus bad debt, but some say there is no good debt and others disagree. What is your view? My view is that borrowing money that will help you make money can be beneficial for your overall finances. Borrowing money that just sucks money out of your life is just 100% bad debt. So for example, buying a home, you know, people talk about a home isn't a good investment. Well, you're not buying your home as an investment. Your home is your home and you may end up you know, you get some tax breaks for it. And typically over time, real estate tends to appreciate. So you do end up earning something from it. So to buy a house, most people can't pay cash for a house and using someone else's money to buy your home, which will eventually probably, if you live in it for at least 10 years, give you back more money than you paid. I think that's not a bad debt. I think it moves your finances forward. I think spending money on stuff that you're going to use up like consumables and borrowing money for that is negative for your overall financial picture. I'm not saying using a credit card is bad. I'm saying going into credit card debt for consumables is bad. Yeah. If you're going into consumer credit card debt, then basically you're just kind of spending beyond your means in in a lot of cases, whereas the home and things like that, it might be not within your means today. But like you said, there are benefits that are coming out of it in the long run. And I guess that's why it's just really important to know what debt you can afford to take on for the long run benefits that you're going to get. I feel like there's a difference between borrowing and debt. I feel like borrowing is a positive thing and debt is a negative thing. Well, that's a good way to look at it. That's sort of in my head, you know, like you're borrowing money to buy a house and you have a house. You're borrowing money to get an education and then you have an education. I still think you should be careful how much money you borrow and all of, be careful of all the other terms involving the borrowing, but taking on debt for things that don't help you and, and you can't always avoid that. Right. But that's the difference. Yeah. And, you know, while you're talking about student loans, it's it's such a thorn in so many people's sides right now. But a big part of the reason for that is because many of them didn't fully understand what they were signing up for. Like you said, it can be a good investment. I mean, there are a lot of ways to avoid debt with paying for school. And if you can do that by any means, it's always the best way to go. But if you're going to take these loans, it's really important to understand what you're signing up for so that they don't burden in you for life. So what are some of the most common things that you hear about student loans as far as if I'd only known? Most people don't realize that although they can start paying their loans back after they graduate, they don't have to wait that long to start paying it back. You can start paying your student loans the day after you get them, and that will reduce the amount of interest that builds up on the loan. That's another thing is a lot of people have loans where interest starts adding on the day they take out the loan, even though they don't have to make payments for another however many years until they stop going to school. So they don't realize that their loans are getting bigger. They're not staying the same. Somebody who borrows $10,000 can end up owing $30,000. Yeah. And the thing is, people don't realize that you have to start paying your loans back the minute you are not a full-time student anymore. So that means if you have a family emergency and you have to leave school, your loans are due. It's not just after you graduate. It's when you stop going. And for those people who decide they're not going to finish or anything like that, there's still those big loans to pay, right? Yeah. The other thing that I hear a lot of times is mistakes when it comes to financial aid, because most people think of financial aid as a grant, something they don't have to pay back, but financial aid could also mean student loans. Is that right? Yeah. Those, when you get from the school, like how much you have to pay, how much you're getting in scholarships and grants and how much is available that you can borrow, it all looks the same. It's hard to differentiate 
what kind of money it is because what you end up looking at is your family share and everything else is not you paying money out of your pocket right now. And it looks like it's all from the same pile, but it's not necessarily. I mean, the biggest problem with student loans is that most people, I would say virtually no one who is taking out a student loan understands what they're doing because they're 18. Yeah. So, I mean, there's got to be places where they can go to get somebody to help them look these over and really fully understand what they're signing up for before they do it, right? Well, you would think that, yes, but also kids don't understand what loans and debt are when they're taking them out. They don't have a concept of it yet and interest and things like that. I mean, some do. I'm not saying no kids understand it, but in general, I mean, most young people don't really understand. A lot of adults don't really understand how different kinds of debt work. Yeah, that's for sure. So I'm such a big advocate of having personal financial education in middle school and high school, and it's starting to pick up a little bit, but there's no way a person who hasn't had any kind of background should be responsible for those loans. I mean... I almost feel like some student loan is predatory. And I don't mean they're, it's like a payday loan where they're actively trying to trap someone, but in the way that they know the people they're giving those loans to don't fully understand them. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Yeah. And where it can be a benefit, it's such a detrimental thing to so many because these kids, like you said, they're 18. They're looking at, wow, this company is going to give me a pile of money right now. And, you know, I've heard so many cases where a lot of them go out and buy new clothes or go out and buy, you know, just other stuff and don't spend all of their financial aid money on school. And then it's like, you know, woohoo, I went out and partied and had fun for a while, but didn't realize all the money that I'm going to be paying back on top of what I borrowed. That's a very good point. Actually, a lot of times student loan money goes straight to the school. And if it turns out to be more than the tuition and stuff, it goes back to the borrower and the borrowers don't necessarily realize that's part of their loan. They're just getting what looks like free money. Well, they can just, they can give that money back right away. Yeah. And they don't know that. Right. So those are definitely the things that kids need to be aware of and and parents too, you know, when, when helping their kids through this. I think the people who are in the student debt crisis right now, I think it's actually happening more because their parents didn't have student loans. When I was going to college, like student loans weren't a thing the way they are now. Yeah. It was more affordable and it just wasn't the same level of student loan that there is now. So their parents wouldn't have necessarily known all the ins and outs because they didn't have them the same way at all. But the people who are being plagued by the student loan debt now, their kids are not going to have the same issues because they're going to make sure their kids don't, which I think is a silver lining if there could be one. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of times out of somebody else's misery comes somebody else's gain because certainly the people who have been through the misery can help those coming you know, after them to avoid that misery. Now, after the fact, a lot of times people are thinking about consolidating debt, whether it's student loans or other kinds of debt. And they a lot of times think that this is the best way to pay it off, which in some cases it can be, but there's also some pitfalls to that. What kind of pitfalls do you see that they may not be aware of? Well, it depends on how you consolidate your loans and who with. There are definitely a lot of scammers in this space and they'll do things like tell you stop paying your debts now while we're doing this consolidation loan. And that is the exact opposite of good advice. People are sort of more familiar with transferring credit card balances to like a zero balance card and they might do like four credit cards onto that. That's a consolidation. That's moving a bunch of loans into one loan. It's the same thing. When you work with a loan consolidation company, you have to be very careful and understand what they're doing because sometimes what they're doing is partially getting rid of some of your debt and that can mean a huge tax bill. Sometimes they're just scammers and they're telling you to pay them and they'll pay your debts and then they don't. And they tell you not to contact any of your lenders. Terrible idea. If anyone tells you not to do that, don't listen. Also, if it's on student loans, if you have federal student loans and you consolidate to a private loan, you lose all of the protections that come with federal loans. Mm -hmm. 
So there's a lot to think about when you're doing, it's not necessarily a bad thing to consolidate your loans. If it's easier for you to make one payment than five payments, both financially and organizationally. Am I right in saying that most of the time you can actually do that yourself? I mean, these debt consolidation companies, they're kind of doing the same thing that you could do yourself, right? Right. I mean, what you technically could do is if you have high interest debt, that you took out when you had bad credit and now you have better credit, you could get a loan, a personal loan at a lower rate than your high interest debt and then use that money to pay off your other debts and you've just consolidated your debt into one loan payment. But if you're going to consolidate, you need to make sure that, first of all, you have better credit than you did when you took out your other loans. You want to make sure that you're getting a lower rate than you're already paying. And you want to make sure that you're not working with someone who's a liar and a cheat. (laughs) And if you're doing it yourself, you also want to make sure that there's no fees, right? Because I actually used the 0% balance transfer when I was trying to get out of debt. But I always looked for what the fees were. I mean, obviously, the interest rate after that promotional period ended just in case I couldn't pay it off on time. And any fees that went with it, because a lot of times there's a three to 5% balance transfer fee. So if you do that math and you don't come out on top, it's really not going to be beneficial. Am I right about that? Yes. And if you can't pay off this lower cost debt in time, Mm -hmm. don't do it because then your rate is going to go up retroactively. That's right. Because it goes on to all the debt that you transferred in the beginning, not just what's left, right? No, it's just on what's left, but from day one. From day one, right. Yeah. So it's just important to know. I mean, because I think a lot of these things can be beneficial, but sometimes the way they're phrased and the fact that people are just desperate to get out of debt and aren't really paying attention lead to them making these decisions without knowing everything that is facing them and making this decision. I honestly wish they would come talk to me before they did it. Yeah. We could figure out the best way because it's not the same for everyone. Absolutely. So I hope that people will call you if they are facing something like this so that they can get your input ahead of time because you are always filled with the best knowledge on this stuff in my view. Well, I mean, some of the most important things to do is to get your credit in shape before you even think about doing any of this stuff because if you still have bad credit, none of these things are going to be as helpful as they would be if you just got your credit up a little bit. Right. So let's talk about that from the standpoint of making your credit better and also about building your credit. First of all, there's a lot of people who manage to pay off all their debt and then they're surprised to learn that their credit scores will actually go down once they stop using credit. But there are also some who get caught up in this going into debt just to boost their credit scores when they don't have to do that. So where's the balance between those? Okay. Two big things going on here. When you pay down debt, your score will often drop a little bit, but then it will rebound unless you completely stop using any form of credit at all whatsoever, which most people don't. When you're first starting to build credit, it's good to use credit. But like you said, do not go into debt to build credit because That has the opposite effect and could ruin your future finances. Getting a credit card with a couple hundred dollar limit or being, you can be a user on someone else's credit card and their credit score can help build your credit score as long as, you know, it's a person with a good credit score and you both understand what's going on with the card and make sure that the card reports to both people who are approved users on the card So a lot of parents can do that with their kids. I did that with mine. Even things like making sure you pay all your bills on time, your phone bill, your internet bill, your rent. It may not improve your credit to pay on time, but it will absolutely ruin your credit to not pay on time. Some cards are easier to get than others. Like a lot of times it's really easy to get a gas credit card. And typically you don't charge up thousands of dollars on gas credit cards. So those can be good starter cards because you're only using them for that one thing and then you pay them. What about credit builder loans? Can you explain what they are and are they a good idea? Well, they sort of are if you use them the right way. Basically, it forces you to save 
the money you need to borrow before you borrow it and then gives you the opportunity to pay it back. But that way you're paying somebody else interest to force yourself to save money and make payments. I thought I understood that it was like they would loan you money and then you would start paying back that money with interest. But if it was only to build your credit, I didn't understand why. Like you could get a secured credit card, put your money onto it, use it for groceries or gas or whatever, and just pay that off to build your credit rather than getting a loan for money that you're not even using and then paying back interest on that. So I'm just well, kind of- credit builder loans, I think, are often for if you want more money than a credit card. OK, secured credit cards usually start with a one hundred or two hundred dollars mm-hmm. and credit builder loans can be more like five hundred to twenty five hundred dollars. But in both cases, you have to save up the money first yeah. and then borrow it back from yourself, but pay the company that's facilitating interest as sort of the fee for them helping build your credit. It's a good practice to save up money first and then buy something, but doing that yourself doesn't build your credit. Okay, while we're on the subject of secured and unsecured, let's talk about what the difference is between secured and unsecured debt and why that difference is so important. Secured debt means that you have something of value that the person you're borrowing money from can take if you don't pay them back. It could be a house, a car, a pile of money but they have a claim on whatever it is if you don't pay them. Unsecured means there's nothing behind it. If you don't pay them back, it's tough luck on them, which is why unsecured debt virtually always has much, much higher interest rates attached to it. A lot of times people consider taking out loans against their home equity or their car to pay off higher interest debt. And those would be the secured loans, right? I mean, because your home or car are attached to those. So those are secured, but they're not always good ideas. And also many people don't realize they're taking out secured loans, which is bad. Yeah, because now you're turning an unsecured credit card debt, which if you had to file bankruptcy, God forbid, that would be gone rather than, you know, if you take out like a home equity loan to pay that off, but you're still spending on your credit card. Now, if you go into bankruptcy, they can take your home, right? Yeah, but also some payday loans have obscure language that securitizes the person's house Oh, wow. or car, more often car especially with predatory type loans, they do sometimes have those kind of provisions in them. And technically payday loans are secured because you have to give them access to your bank account or your paycheck. Yikes. By the way. That is really scary. So while we're on the subject of predatory lending, I mean, it is legal, but there are certainly red flags to watch out for. Let's talk about what those are. Well, it is legal, but in my opinion, it is just plain wrong. And unconscionable, honestly. It makes me very sad that people do this to other people. Predatory loans are loans purposely given to people knowing that they can't possibly pay them back with the goal of keeping them in debt and paying interest for a long time. It's purposeful. They get trapped and tricked into taking out loans that they can virtually never recover from. Kind of like modern day loan sharking, right? Yeah, but honestly, almost worse because when you go to a loan shark, you know you're going to a loan shark. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) Right? When you're going to a payday lender, it doesn't seem the same. Right, because they seem to won't care about you, right? And want to help you out of your desperate situation. Well, but they also like, they have a store. Mm -hmm. They seem just more legit. They're like, oh, it's just until your paycheck. Right. Like, It seems like to people an advance on their paycheck. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like you're going to a loan shark, even though you are. So honestly, I feel like loan sharks are more reputable than payday lenders. (laughs) Certainly (laughs) Certainly more transparent. So let's talk about how the cycle works, how easy it is to get trapped in this kind of cycle, because there might be people out there going, I don't understand. It is just until my paycheck and then everything will be fine. Seems that way, yes. But the interest on these can be more than 300% a year. That's That's three times more money than you borrowed. 
So it's triple the amount you borrowed. It doesn't seem that way because they say $20 fee, $15 fee, $15 per $100 and things like that. And it doesn't feel like you're paying 300% interest. I'm only paying $15, sort of. Yeah. So the moral of the story is do the math, right? (laughs) Yeah. But the other part is, okay, you don't have enough money to cover an expense right now. You need the money from your paycheck today. You're not going to get it for another week. So you go to a payday lender, they give you the money you need. And then when you get your paycheck, you pay them back the amount plus whatever fees are on top of that. But then you don't have that money for whatever else you would normally need your paycheck for. So you're forced to borrow more money. And if your paycheck isn't enough to cover the paycheck and the amount you borrowed and the fees, you automatically get rolled into another loan. These loans constantly roll over. Wow. And there, you get into a situation where it's almost impossible to pay them back. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because if you had enough money in the first place, you wouldn't have taken out the loan. So borrowing it against your next paycheck, yeah, I mean, you're still going to come up short and there goes the vicious cycle. But in the moment people are desperate for this money, it's like, what else can I do? So, Well, actually, there are other things you can do. Yeah. But I just wanted to flip back real quick to when you said people should do the math. So if you're paying $15 on $100 for two weeks, that's the same as paying 15 times 24% interest annually on a loan. I can't do that math in my head, but it's a big lot of interest. Yeah. It's a crazy percentage. And if you saw that like on a credit card, you'd be like, I'm not taking that out. Right. So exactly. They don't translate it into the percent for you because $15 is easier to swallow than 475% interest. Exactly. It's the same Um, as, you know, when they say it's just the price of a cup of coffee per day, you know, well, add it up. So some credit unions offer, they're similar to payday loans, but they will only lend you the amount they know you can pay back. And the fees are 100% normal and reasonable and affordable. Some banks will do it too. Like if you have direct deposit or a checking account or a relationship with the bank, they will often have some kind of, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but it's something like pay help or loan or something like that. Okay. You can also ask your boss for an advance, by the way, because that way you're just borrowing from yourself. And then there are a bunch of apps out there now. And I'm super sorry that I don't remember the names of any of them off the top of my head, but there are a bunch of apps that you can use that help you get your money before your paycheck, as long as you can prove you've already earned that money. I've read about those and I was reading about them in your book and I, I think you have the names of them in your book, right? I do. And okay. and they are absolutely, they have fees attached. A hundred percent they do, but it's not nearly as much as a payday loan. They're not predatory because you know a hundred percent upfront what's going on and it just helps you access your paycheck as you earn it instead of waiting two weeks to get your paycheck. Like if employers just paid us an envelope of cash every day, nobody would be in this situation where- They had to wait for the money. I'm not saying people would never have expenses that were more than their paycheck, but the timing issue wouldn't be an issue. I agree with you to a point because certainly, you know, if you got paid every day and you could put that money aside and budget for it properly, that would take care of a lot of the problems. But it kind of scares me to look at those apps and go, okay, people are going to be getting their money every day and going, wow, look, I can go out to eat every day. But then what happens when rent comes due? Well, yes, that's true. I mean, you have to be careful with pretty much Everything. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just because, in the way you use it. Exactly. But there definitely are times when, you know, for example, I don't get paid until the 24th, but my rent comes due on the 18th right. or something like that. And you can't change your paycheck date. There are some times when credit cards or utilities and other companies will let you change your due date to match when you get paid. So that's something to try to, to help match up your cash flow in and cash flow out a little bit better is you can, you may be able to change your payment dates. And another thing that I've also started seeing is online banks that say you can get your money a few days earlier than your paycheck normally hits your bank account. But 
again, this kind of concerns me because if you're coming up short paycheck to paycheck, then the date that your paycheck is hitting really doesn't matter, right? I mean, maybe for one time to cover something, but you're just going to get your paycheck within the same time frame the next time around. I mean, if it's a few days early now, it's still going to be two more weeks until your next paycheck. So in the long run, that doesn't really help, does it? In the long run, probably not. But there are many people that it's, I mean, it's impossible to get ahead. There's truly very limited, if any, affordable housing in the country. I read somewhere that there's nowhere in the United States, and I don't know if this is true. I'm saying I read it somewhere and I can't remember for the life of me what it was. It was a study that there was nowhere in the United States where a person working a single full-time job at minimum wage could afford to pay rent. I mean, that's rent. That doesn't even include electricity and food and clothes. And what if you have kids and health insurance or for a lot of people, it's honestly not possible to get ahead. And that's one of the big problems with debt is there's no other choice. That's probably why budgeting can help a lot with this, especially with, you know, advances and stuff like that. If you're getting paid, you know, as you go and everything so that you can put it aside as much as humanly possible to make sure that you can cover your expenses as they come in for as much money as there is in your paycheck. Right. I mean, it honestly, here's something I don't like about this book. It's about debt. And I get that it's supposed to be about debt. It's debt 101. But really, debt is a piece of everybody's entire financial life. Right. And you really can't look at one piece by itself. It's more holistic than that. It's the budget and your income and your actual expenses and how well you're planning. And do you have retirement savings? And do you have kids? What are your future plans? It's everything all together and focusing on one area without knowing the other parts of the picture or without considering the other parts of the picture won't work. That's a very good point. And I guess that goes to the whole thing that these, you know, debts really as a whole on their surface are options and they may or may not be the right option for me or for you. And that's why it's so important to really understand the ins and outs of what goes with it before you decide to take it on. So it seems like one of the biggest mistakes that people take with respect to, let's say, taking out loans is not knowing what they can truly afford. You know, you go to a car lot to buy a car or you go to buy a home. And a lot of times you're depending on the finance company to tell you what you can afford. And they're going to, you know, try to make it as big of a loan as possible, obviously, because they want to finance on top of that. but it may not fit within your budget and you're the only one who knows that. So how important do you think it is for people to really understand what fits in their own budget before they go to take out these loans? Well, (laughs) that is a very important point. And I do cover that in in the book, but also when I talk to people, they are going to give you the absolute most you can afford based on your gross income and not your life. You need to figure out what your budget can fit based on your, the amount of money you actually take home, the other expenses, you know, you have, and if you can't afford the loan for the car you want, you need to want a different car. Right. (laughs) I mean, No car dealer is going to tell you that, but you really need to figure out how much car or how much house you can afford before you walk in because they will confuse you with monthly payments and they'll wrap everything together and they'll say, oh, you if you pay it over seven years instead of three years, then we can lower the payment to this. But you're overall going to pay double the money. I was talking to a client the other day who's looking to buy a house and she said, I hope the mortgage companies like me. And I said, no. You hope you like them. Right. Because you're the customer here. You they have to convince you that they're doing a good job for you. You are the one who is buying the house. You get to decide who you want to work with. And Um, she said, Well, but I have to apply to them. And I said, Well, yeah, that's how it's set up, but you can choose whichever one you want to apply to. 
don't worry about who wants to give you money. Everyone wants to give you money. Think about who you want to give your money to. Absolutely. I think that's such an important point because whether you're taking out a loan from a predatory lender or from a legitimate lender, the choice is still yours. And I think there's so many times when people say, oh, you know, that was horrible. They did this to me and they did that to me. And that may be true, but they can only do that if you let them. You know, it's so important for people to take back their own power and really make sure they know what they're signing up for. Problem is, is that finances feel very intimidating to yeah. almost everybody. I mean, to me sometimes. Yeah. They're very intimidating. The people on the other side of the table have these totally long contracts and they do this all day, every day, and they know the buzzwords to use and they know how to make you feel like you're the one in the helpless seat. And it's a very bad dynamic. Financial empowering of regular people is the only way this is going to shift. And it's really hard to feel that way without someone on your side, which is why people like you are so amazing because you help empower people financially so they do have the confidence to do what's best for them and not get sucked into what they think they can get. Well, that's so nice of you to say. The only way I can empower them, though, is through information that comes out like yours. So I truly, truly appreciate all of your books, especially this one, because it teaches us so much about what you need to know about debt before you get into it. And I know that we're uh, coming up to the end here, but I really wanted to ask you about, because I was really surprised to read in your book that medical debt is the leading cause of bankruptcy. But this is something that we really have no control over for the most part. So what are some alternatives to dealing with medical debt that could keep people out of bankruptcy? Here's the thing about medical debt. This is one time you literally don't have a choice. You need care. You have no idea how much it's going to cost, which is a completely forked up system. Yes. Even if you ask how much it's going to cost, no one knows. No one will tell you. Totally experienced. It's very, you don't know what your insurance company will and won't cover if you even have insurance. And even if you think your insurance will cover everything, oftentimes there's an out of network this or whatever. It's impossible to plan for medical debt, but there are a lot of ways that you can help make it slightly less horrible. And one is negotiating. Once you get the bill that your insurance company says, you know, I'm not paying this and you have a $3,000 bill, is you call the provider and you say, I don't have $3,000. How much is this really? Most medical professionals will do some kind of payment plan. And yes, there will be some interest on it, but it's lower than credit card interest and it's better than bankruptcy. And usually those go from 18 months to three years. They're not super long, but it can at least help so that you don't have to make a giant payment all at once. And a lot of them will do it without interest. You have to work with them the best that you can. Ignoring it's not going to be helpful. That's just going to make it worse. And I know it's really overwhelming when you get those bills. I have a son that uses a lot of healthcare and sometimes the bills have been shocking to me. And what my insurance decides to cover and not cover has been surprising to me. And you just work with the providers the best you can to be able to get the care you need. The only thing, and I hate to beat this drum into the ground, but I don't because if nobody's ever heard me say this on this podcast before, the saving grace for me, because we have a, a PPO and that's where you, you know, you have to pay these out of pocket costs until you get to the deductible. And there's out of, you know, network costs to concern with if you, even if you don't know, if some, you know, we had a doctor that sent our lab work to an out of network lab facility and ended up with a bill for that. How did we know? We didn't. There was no way for us to know. But the only saving grace for us has been the HSA. And so if you're having to pay out of pocket for expenses uh, and you have a high deductible health plan, which is why you're paying out of pocket all these expenses, get the HSA because that's been the one lifesaver for me. Yes. I love HSAs. In fact, I write about them all the time because they're amazing. A lot of people don't know they can open their own HSAs. They think you can only do it through your job, but that's not true. You can open your own. Exactly. And the thing with me, I just want to mention this too, because what happened with us was Scott had to have surgery and we were thinking, well, how are we going to pay for this? You know, there's not enough room in what we're getting from our paycheck to 
pay for this surgery. And I have this HSA, but how am I supposed to contribute to it when I can't afford to lower the paycheck every couple of weeks? So what I did was change my withholdings. And that gave me the room to contribute to my HSA without changing the amount that I was getting on my paycheck. Does that make sense? Or is that like a danger zone? No, I mean... You'll know at the end of the year if you owe taxes or not. Right. And the Which I didn't. Is so confusing that people who, because of all the big changes, it's almost impossible to tell if you're going to owe or not. Yeah. But the truth is, if you need the money now, you need the money now. Yeah. And it's better to owe the IRS than not get medical care. And that's the other thing that we didn't mention in, in other ways to find money. If you're trying to avoid a predatory loan is you can change your withholdings as well to get more money out of your paycheck. And like you were just saying, I mean, you know, you don't want to owe the IRS at the end of the year, but if you do, it's better than having your lights turned off in the middle of the year, right? Right. The IRS doesn't need your money as much as you do. So at what point does bankruptcy become a viable option for dealing with debt? Because, of course, nobody wants to go down that road. But there are some times where that is the only choice. So how do they decide between, okay, I have a lot of this debt. It seems daunting, but I can find a way to pay it off and move on with my life versus there's just no way I'm going to have to file bankruptcy. I think it largely depends on an honest assessment of how much income you could bring in. And unfortunately, a lot of medical debt, high medical debt, does often involve disabling conditions where people are out of work for months or years following it. So if you are in a situation where you know you're never going to be able to earn enough money to pay off the debts, bankruptcy... It's not a great solution, but it beats the constant stress of having people trying to call you in, trying to figure out how to pay things down. Yes, you are going to lose some of the stuff you have. It's going to happen. They're going to sell off some of your stuff or there's different rules in different states, but you'll be done. It trashes your credit for a long time. It can be very mentally, emotionally upsetting. But once it's actually over, the relief from all that stress is good and better for your recovery if it's medical debt. If you have the possibility of paying some of it back in a moderated way, it's better for your overall finances and a lot of people's mental health isn't the right word, but there's a lot of emotions attached to money. And a lot of people who file bankruptcy feel shame and guilt. And at least with the restructuring type plan where you're figuring out how to pay things down, there's less of a sense of that and more of a sense of, I was in a horrible situation, but here is how I'm working to get myself out. So if you can in some way get yourself out, that can be a good choice. If it's not possible, don't try. And it's hard to know, like you said, because there is so much emotion around it. Sometimes it's hard to know what your own best option is. And that's where you could come in and, you know, help somebody figure that out by going through their finances in a holistic way, right? Yes. And I mean, there are bankruptcy counselors specifically trained in bankruptcy that can help you figure out if it's right for you, which ones are right for you. People also don't know that if you're filing bankruptcy, you don't necessarily have to file every one of your debts. People also think that you can never, ever discharge student loans in bankruptcy, and that is proving to be not true. Wow. (laughs) Good to know. Well, it sounds like you've got quite a few other tricks up your sleeve that will probably be coming in more books because you're like a machine with all these books. I swear, I don't know how you do it. But I definitely want everybody to go and check out your book, Debt 101, because it just really, I found it very empowering and very enlightening about all the different kinds of debt. And really, just like we've been talking about, you know, knowledge is power. And the more that you know about debt before you get into it, the better that you can use it or deal with it, you know, whichever situation you're in, to be on the proactive instead of the reactive and falling prey So how can people get a hold of you if they had questions or wanted a session with you to try to figure some of this out? You just head over to my website, which is michellekagancpa.com. I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and you can contact me in any of those ways. And I'll be happy to talk people through things. 
a lot of times just one conversation helps get them on a path and then they're fine and never need me again, which is perfectly awesome. I'm really happy when that happens. Some people need more help and I'm happy to do that too. Mostly I just, I really want people to have as much information as they can to make the best choices for their own financial lives. Michelle, we so appreciate all of your time. Great information. And this book is Debt 101, but you've got a ton of other great books. Uh, Retirement 101, Budgeting 101. The list goes on and on. They're all available on your website, right? Hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) I think so. And if If not, not, Amazon or Barnes & Noble or maybe Bobby's website. I don't know. (laughs) That's true. They are all well. They're all on my website too. So you can definitely go there and get them. Michelle, thanks again for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Bobby. I always love talking. A big sensible thank you to our guest professor, Michelle Kagan, CPA, financial mentor, and author of Debt 101. Visit her website at michellekagancpa.com or singlemomcpa.com. One of the biggest things I have in common with Michelle and why I love chatting with her so much is that she's so passionate about giving people as much information as possible to make their best financial decisions. Those decisions aren't the same for all of us because it depends on our lives, our current financial situations, and what we're trying to accomplish. But knowledge is power. So let me give you a few more ideas based on what we've already talked about today. First of all, if you haven't heard, on Friday, President Trump announced that they are waiving interest payments on all student loans held by federal government agencies. Now, if this is true, this is such a beneficial program to so many people who are mired in student loan debt right now. A few things to keep in mind. Remember, this is temporary, although they said till further notice, so it could be a very long time. It might be a short time. We don't know. Also, keep in mind that it is interest only. You'll still have to make your payments, but you're going to be paying principal. And the difference between waiving and deferring is that when you defer interest payments, it just means that those interest payments will have to be paid later on and they're accruing as you go. If you're waiving it, that means that there is no interest during that time. So this is the perfect time for you to really beef up those payments. Now, I've heard a lot of people People, you know, when you get an opportunity for 0% interest, things like that, people tend to take advantage of the fact that they don't have to pay as much money during that time, but they forget that that's going to come later on. So take advantage of this time while you are not going to have to pay the interest to really beef up those payments because you're going to be paying down on the principal, which means that when you do start having to pay interest again, you're going to be paying interest on a lot lower of a sum of money. So it's going to save you a lot. Make sure that you read up on this before you make any decisions. First of all, you need to make sure that your student loan is qualified for this program. And second of all, these details are changing moment by moment. But you definitely want to read up on it and find out how you can take advantage of this. There are a lot of dangers to not understanding how student loans work. And I think this is a big part of the student loan crisis that we have right now. Because as Michelle and I were talking about, kids sign up for this stuff all the time, not understanding what they're signing up for. So if you want to understand more about how student loans actually work, check out studentloanhero.com. And I've put a link to an article in the show notes that can really help you out with getting some information on this. Some other ways that student loan debt can become a crisis is, number one, you don't know how much you'll pay back as opposed to how much you'll make. So that means if you haven't done the research on what your major, what your career field is typically paying, you don't know whether the amount that you're taking out for the student loan debt is going to be easily paid back based on what you can expect to make after you graduate. And that could be a really big issue. The other thing is a lot of kids aren't picking schools based on what they can afford, but other things such as a cool college campus or other benefits that a school might have that play into the kind of college experience that they want. And while that's all nice, you need to know what you can actually afford. Because if you sign up for an Ivy League school and take out massive amounts of loans to pay for it, you may have a really hard time paying it back. And a lot of people are experiencing this now and it's putting them off from being able to buy homes, start families. They live in this paycheck to paycheck cycle from the moment they graduate and it just 
it's been devastating for a lot of people. So really take the time to look through and figure out what schools you can afford. Now, using debt to go through school might be the best choice for you if you have a good plan, but if you don't have a plan, do not do this. Again, this is why so many people are ending up mired in student loan debt after the fact. And there are a ton of ways to go through school debt-free. You can get scholarships, you can get grants, you can work, you can start out at community colleges. The bottom line here is that you're the one who decides whether or not it's worth it to take on student loan debt in order to go through school and get a degree that could very well put you in a great position to make a lot of money throughout your life. You're the only one who's going to know whether that's the right choice for you, but you really have to know what you're signing up for. So take all of the options into consideration and put them all into a plan before you sign on the dotted line. The same goes for other debt. If you're about to buy a car or a home, you need to know how much car or home you can afford before you go shopping. Like Michelle and I were talking about, the financiers want to sign you up for as much money as humanly possible based on your income, but they don't know what your expenses are. You're the only one who knows the amount of money monthly that will fit comfortably into your budget that you can afford to pay for your car or your home. So you really need to understand how much that is before you go out and look for a loan. Plus, you need to think about what else there is besides the price of the car or the home. You're going to have repairs, insurance, taxes, and other things that are going to come up. So sit down and make a plan before you go out and take out these loans so that you've thought about all of these things and you have a good idea of how much, again, can fit monthly into your budget to pay for these loans. Never let anyone push you into a bad decision. They're going to give you all these ways that they could help you finance more so that you can get into something even better. But again, you're the one who's going to have to pay this at the end of the day. So take your time. Ask all the questions that you need to ask so that you fully understand what you're signing up for. Don't let them intimidate you into signing up for something you don't understand. And if you need an advocate, get one, whether that means a friend, a family member that can help you figure out all of this ahead of time, or even go with you to get the loan. Make sure that you are armed so that you don't get taken advantage of. And in all of this, the way that you're going to know what these numbers are, are to create a budget and then stick to it. If you need help creating this budget, go get my free 10-day budget challenge at sensiblechat.com. Make sure that you put together a budget before you go and get any kind of a loan. I also want to touch on the pay early apps that I was talking about with Michelle. Again, I highly recommend that you don't use these without a budget. Think this through. If you're getting paid every day, you're getting little amounts of money in your pocket on a daily basis instead of a big chunk every two weeks. And while that might work for you in order to pay for something today instead of having to wait, if that's what you have to do... Think about the fact that you're not going to have a big chunk of money to pay bills when those bills come due. So if you are using these pay early apps, you have to have a budget because that way you know how much you have to set aside for certain things to make sure that you can cover the rent and the utilities and the gas and the groceries when it comes time to pay for those things. Without a budget, there's just too many things. I don't know about you, but I can't keep track of all of that in my head. It's too many different categories and there's too many numbers. So the only way it works for me is to create a budget budget so that everything is right there and you can see it very clearly. How much money do I have for this? Have I saved enough for this? That's what's going to be really important if you're going to use these pay early apps. Now, the reason that you might use these apps is because you're coming up short when a payment is due. So let's talk about some ways to stop that from happening. First of all, you can plan ahead and budget accordingly. 
If you are coming up short, let's say for the electric bill, and the electric bill comes due a couple days before your paycheck, then you need to be setting aside the money for your electric bill in the paycheck before it's due. That way you can get ahead of it. You may need to cut some costs temporarily in order to get ahead. And that may mean that you don't go out to eat a couple of times or cut back a little bit on your entertainment or something like that. But you really need to look and see if there's anything you can cut, at least temporarily, so that you can get ahead and stop those late payments from happening. The other thing that you can do is if you get a tax refund, use that to get a month ahead. If you are always struggling to make your electric bill payment on time, then put aside the amount of money from your tax bill that will get you ahead just for one month for that one bill. That takes the stress away right now. Now, I mentioned that because we're in tax season right now, but you don't always have a tax refund handy. So if this is happening at some other point during the year, you can also consider changing your withholdings just for one or two pay periods until you can get enough money to get ahead for that one bill that's causing you stress and then change your withholdings back. We also talked about what a struggle it is to make ends meet when you're trying to live on minimum wage. So I want to talk about it from two standpoints. First of all, those who are already there. If right now you are trying to make it living on minimum wage and you're coming up short, you might want to consider finding a roommate and sharing those expenses. Cut whatever expenses you possibly can and consider taking on some side hustles to make more money. The other thing that you can do is increase your education so that you can get a job that is not minimum wage because minimum wage, let's face it, it's entry level. It's not designed to be for the rest of your life. So if you're trying to up your standard of living on a minimum wage, it's going to be very difficult. Now, for kids who are looking ahead, don't try to live on your own making minimum wage. Start saving your money now while you have a job but you're living at home where you don't have to pay the overhead. That way, when it comes time to get out on your own, you already have money saved behind you so that you don't have to fall into that paycheck to paycheck cycle. And by that time, you have already put in your time with a minimum wage entry level job and hopefully gotten your education so that when you're you're ready to move out, you not only have savings behind you, but you have the earning power that comes with experience and a college degree or certification of some type that will garner you a job that is not minimum wage. So if you've already taken on debt, make a plan to get rid of it as fast as you possibly can. But if you're thinking of taking on debt, remember it's optional and it's your choice. So what's the best choice for you? Think about what you can afford. What happens if you lose your job? Is the debt you're about to take on necessary to better your life? What alternatives do you have to taking on the debt? And the whole reason for going through this exercise is just basically to get you thinking about the fact that debt is not a foregone conclusion. It doesn't have to be an inevitable You can make the choice whether or not you want to step in that debt based on how important whatever it is that you're going to pay for with that debt is to you. Debt is a risk. It's a risk that some people are not willing to take. Others dive right in without realizing they're even taking a risk. Now, I'm not here to tell you whether or not debt is the right thing to do. I just want to make sure you have all the facts before taking the risk. Because no matter how small the debt, it is a risk. When you use debt, you're borrowing other people's money. And every time you do that, you give away a piece of your financial independence. So if you're going to take that risk, be rational, not emotional. Your emotion will tell you that you can have whatever you want right now. So go for it. Live your life. Your rationale will tell you that you can have it now, but you'll have to pay for it later. Is it worth it? Worth the additional amount you'll pay in interest? Worth the chance that the payments and interest will build every time you use debt. Worth the chance that your life today could change tomorrow and you may no longer be able to pay it back. Worth the chance that you'll have to stay at a job you hate in order to afford the payments. These are all questions to consider and only you can answer them. But if you're going to take the risk, think about how you're going to manage that risk. Have you crunched the numbers to make sure you can truly afford it without impacting the rest of your financial life? What's your backup plan if your current situation changes? Here's what it comes down to. One question. 
Is what you want in the moment worth what you give up in the long run? I can't answer that for you on an individual basis because you are the only one who knows your set of numbers. The formula is really simple. Add up your income, subtract your expenses, and now you've got the number you can play with. Do the math. Live the life. That's what a budget does for you. Takes all those pieces and puts them together in a way that works for you and gives you the freedom to change those at any time to keep them working for you. So let me ask you that question again. Is what you want in the moment worth what you give up in the long run? Do the math, live the life. It's the perfect concept because it won't lie to you. It's not trying to manipulate you. It's not trying to get anything out of you. It's straight numbers, straight facts. Speaking of facts and dealing with debt, If you're fighting your way out of it right now and need some inspiration, you don't want to miss the next episode. We're going to chat with Ashley Patrick, host of the Money Mindset podcast and founder of BudgetsMadeEasy.com. She paid off $45,000 in 17 months and she's going to share her story. So check back on March 30th. Thanks for joining me on this episode. And remember, if you want to get your finances in shape, do the math live the life. That does it for this episode of Sensible Chat with your host, Sensible Bobby. Links for all the resources mentioned can be found in the show notes for this episode at sensiblechat.com. That's sensible with a C. While you're there, find your favorite app to be sure and never miss a show. On social media, look for us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you need help with your budget or want to share your thoughts, reach out to Sensible Bobby through the contact page at sensiblechat.com. That's sensible with a C. Thank you.